Hello, hello. I hope you had a great Fika. One thing we kind of realized over Fika is that like the stage is actually just, or the, the theater is actually just really big. And there's this like whole section up here that we actually haven't been looking too much at. So for the rest of the conference now, this is for all of you up there. Yeah, hi. Hello. <laughs> yeah. So our next speaker, gosh, this feels so awkward. Most of it, I feel like you can like look straight into my brain through my nose. Just You'll just have to deal with it. Just keep going. <laughs> we have a web engineer from Mozilla who has been working on hybrid app development with Android and React. Kate Hudson, yay! <laughs> <laughs> okay. Hi, everybody. Let's see if I can play this successfully. Awesome. All right. My name's Kate Hudson. I'm a web engineer from Canada. I work for Mozilla. Um, so to start off, I want to know how many of you are, have to deal with creating, deploying, or maintaining code that has to run in a browser. I can't see very well. Whoa, that's a lot of you. Yes. My stuff will be interesting. All right, how many of you have to use some kind of build tool to do that? Nice. All right, anyone actually use NPM scripts as their core build tool? All right, good. This is good so far. You'll have some new stuff to take home. All right, uh, so because I'm a developer at Mozilla, you know, I'm a bit biased here, but I absolutely love writing code for the browser despite all the pain and the weirdness. I love it because the browser is a platform for rich user interfaces. It's new enough that we can do crazy experimental stuff like, you know, the um, really cool augmented reality thing. What, like, hi, that's awesome. That stuff was great. Um, and, but we're also mature enough that we can start being really intentional about how we build things and as well as the community we want to build around them. But the thing is, I kind of hate build tools. And I don't just mean the ones that have popped up recently in JavaScript land, but like every time I use Gradle on an Android project or um, you know, make when I'm working on something written by someone who hates JavaScript or like literally anything, I always end up in the situation where things started out so well and then just went to utter shit. Like it's, it's just what happens with build tools. And to some extent, I think this is actually kind of a disastrous intersection of two theories of how systems work. So let's look at that. The first theory, which is from a book I heard about from an amazing talk by CJ Bott, you should look it up, um, is John Gall's Big Bang Theory of Systems. And it asserts that despite all your efforts, systems will grow until they fill the known universe. And if you've ever seen a grunt file, you know what I'm talking about. And if you combine that with the irony of automation, which is basically that as automated systems grow in both utility and complexity, they become less and less understandable to the operator, it's actually not that surprising that over time, your build configurations and automated systems <laughs> will utterly fail you, right? I mean, this is just the law of systems. I love fail of robots. It's my favorite thing on the internet. So, but despite all of this, like this is kind of depressing, um, you know, I do think that your automated front end workflow can actually be okay. If you're willing to consider the nature of the things that you're putting in it, if you spend some time upfront designing for simplicity, and if you're willing to make the right compromises, not just compromises that are stylish or fashionable. So I have a couple of reasons why I wanna show you how you could do this with NPM scripts. Um, the first is that I actually think the environment in which NPM scripts run is particularly well suited to designing simple, composable, powerful front-end automated tasks. And you know, this is actually not an original or new concept. A lot of people have written about this, um, such as this article by Substack in 2013. Um, the main criticisms, though, back then was that, you know, the approach didn't really work for Windows users and that NPM run wasn't quite powerful enough. But I think since the release of NPM 2.0 this year and the upcoming 3.0 release, you can actually start to do this stuff in production and make it work. So the second reason I want to talk about it is that I've actually had some success with the approach in my own um, workflow. So over the last few months, I've switched my team at Mozilla 
over from uh, maintaining gulp files that were 200 or 300 or 400 lines long to using NPM scripts exclusively. And the result, that our, uh, the result has been that our front end builds have been more reliable, more resistant to bloat, and most importantly, our entire team is able to understand, debug, and reason with them instead of just one or two people who, you know, know the file. You know, you're probably that person, right? Yeah. All right, so let's dive into some code and some ideas. Both are good. All right, so what's so special about the NPM script environment? Why is it well suited to dealing with things we care about, like processing files, compiling code, running development servers, et cetera, et cetera? So actually, who uses Node or NPM um, for their front end stuff? Yeah, almost all of you, yeah. Um, because, you know, I'm, I'm actually really glad that you said that because most of what I'm gonna say about scripts being useful is actually kind of predicated on the idea that you're using node implementations for your tasks. So, okay, we're good, we're good. I'm really lucky today. Like, normally people are like, oh, I don't use node, I use Ruby or something, I don't know. Um, this is, so, so we're good. Um, so this is what a very simple script looks like. You've probably seen it before on your own projects or open source projects. Um, the interface is extremely simple. You define each script as, under a target in your package JSON, and you run it in the command line by calling npm run x. Uh, this particular example, uh, it's the npm run test. You can actually shorten that to npm test. There's some scripts that you can do that with. Um, but besides defining the very standard scripts like start and test, you can actually create custom tasks under any target you want. So in this case, we have a target called foo, and we call npm run foo. Easy. The real magic of npm run is that you're able to leverage both the capabilities of your shell environment, which is very powerful in its own right, as well as any node executables you've installed as local dependencies or dev dependencies with npm. So you can kind of choose how much or how little you want to use node and how much you want to use your operating system. Um, so your shell environment, which might be something like bash or the Windows command line, was pretty much designed to chain tasks and handle files. And that's super good news because the bulk of what you're doing in a front-end workflow is exactly that. Uh, many of the utilities are surprisingly cross-compatible. So, you know, we can pipe data with a pipe. Um, we can, you know, the, use a greater than sign to write standard out to a file. Um, the double ampersand we can use to actually run tasks in series. Awesome. Um, for bashisms that are not cross-compatible, we can actually replace them with node implementations. There's actually a lot out there. Some of them need a little bit more maintaining, but, um, you know, we've got a node implementations for cat. Um, yeah, like anything you need, pretty much, there's probably a node shim for it. So on the node side of things, NPM actually adds the node module slash dot bin folder to the path for any scripts that are run. So what that means is you actually don't have to call the whole path to the executable. You can actually just call it itself, which is super nice, makes our build scripts look great, and also great for Windows where paths are weird. Um, yeah, great. So remember this, a good automated system takes advantage of the natural interface presented by its component parts. Um, so I don't really like plugin systems we rely on for JS build tools because I think they add a lot of unnecessary hidden complexity and vectors for bugs and create more code to maintain and obscure the source of what you're trying to do. Luckily for us, almost every tool you're likely to use in a front-end workflow already comes with a command line interface. You can use npm run with all your favorite stuff right out of the box. How awesome is that? No plugins, yay. Um, so let's take a look at some common tasks. What might we use? So Browserify is a great example of something that works brilliantly in an NPM script since it's built with a command line in mind. So in this task, we're, you know, we're um, calling Browserify on our entry file, we're adding source maps, and we're using the Reactify transform. So this could be my whole talk, actually, these two slides. This is the exact same task um, written in Gulp. Uh, this is actually from the Gulp docs. So, I mean, that in itself kind of says a lot. Um, so if you don't like adding a lot of options in line, you can often delegate them to like, you know, tool-specific configurations, which is fine. Here we're calling for our build.js script. Uh, we're just calling webpack with the default parameters. Um, we've also added a second version of this by calling npm run build.js in a new uh, watch.js task. 
um, with a custom argument, which is a new feature in um, NPM 2.0. Uh, more on that later, but I just wanted to show you an example of delegating some of the configuration. Um, so here are a few more examples of what you can do. You can compile CSS, you can run tests, linting, um, you know, you can use Babel to transpile ES6, run a live reload server. There's, you know, pretty much anything you can do with your favorite build tool today, you can do with NPM scripts. So the other interesting thing we get with scripts, uh, besides, um, you know, the shell and the node executables, is we actually have them run in the context of the NPM lifecycle. You've probably seen something like this. Um, the whole concept is that some scripts are considered special, and they're triggered when events happen um, when you're using NPM. So for example, if you define scripts called pre-install or post-install, they'll run before and after um, you actually run NPM install in the root directory, or if someone installs your package, um, it will also run that time. So more useful lifecycle events you could hook into, depending on you know, what your workflow is, um, you know, you could hook into NPM publish, which allows you to do things like run tests or build distributions before publishing to NPM. Um, and you can also use the recently added hook for NPM version, which you could use, you know, for deploying or doing special preparation when you're tagging releases. So that's super awesome. Finally, you can also use custom lifecycle hooks for your scripts by prepending pre and post to the script, like the custom script name. So if I run npm potato and I define a pre-potato and a post-potato script, um, I will see that output every time in that order. So it's kind of cool. All right. So now that we have a good start on interfacing with all the tools we're going to need, let's go to the part about designing for simplicity. How do we do this with npm scripts? So one of my favorite talks on the subject of simplicity in software design is Simple Made Easy by Rich Hickey, who's the author of uh, Clojure. You might not agree with everything he says um, in the talk, but it's definitely worth checking out if you like thinking about this kind of stuff. The most relevant properties of simplicity, I think, to our discussion are that components of the automated system are simple when they have single, well-defined objectives, and that good, complex tasks are composed of simple ones. I know you all know this because you're programmers and you're good programmers, um, you know, hopefully most of the time. Uh, but it's worth applying this to, you know, our build scripts too. So let's start with a task that doesn't fit our definition of symbol. This task does three things. It um, lints our code, it does some style checking, and it runs our unit tests. Um, so this is fine if your, you know, your script file is really small, whatever. But it, we need to extend this a little bit if we want to use it for larger systems. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to split it up into three scripts. Uh, so we have our lint, JS, CS, and unit um, tests in three scripts. And we can just call them in series um, by using npm run. Pretty easy. Um, now if we take this a step further, we can introduce a scaffolding tool to help us out. Um, npm run all is a tiny node module I really like to use that helps us run multiple npm tasks in series or in parallel. It is cross uh, compatible with Windows. Um, as you can see here, we pass in the name of our three tasks uh, and we can just do it like that. Super nice. It also has a glob like feature that will look for all tasks under a namespace. So here we prefix every task with, um, you know, test. And that's awesome. They, they also, they run in the order that they're defined in the file, so you'll always know, you know, if they're running in series, you'll always know the order. Um, so the complete example looks like this. In the first section, uh, we've got, you know, a set of watch tasks that we're running with start as well as a server. We're using the parallel option for npm run all so we can have those run in parallel. Um, the second set of tasks is a bunch of build tasks that run one time. So that's a great example of organizing your script file so it's really readable. Um, the other thing you might have noticed we talked about before is the argument syntax. Um, so this really helps for composability. You can write one task, so let's say your Webpack or your Browserify task, and then you could have different subsets like for your development environment or your production environment by passing uh, new arguments to that task. So that's cool. So we've learned about the le how to leverage the power of Node and Shell. We've talked about designing our system for simplicity and composability. 
what trade-offs are we making and are they the right ones? This is a super important thing to talk about when you're discussing pretty much any system that you're building um, on any project. So NPM scripts are not as full-featured as something like Gradle that can do dependency management between tasks or you know, caching of partial, partial builds like we have in Make. Um, if you need that, you might have to use something more full-featured. But chances are because you know, you're doing front-end web dev, you're not dealing with build times on the orders of, order of tens of minutes, and you can actually afford to trade off that optimization for readability. And uh, readability translates essentially to reliability, um, especially when your team can reason properly about what you're doing. Um, I mean, that's my opinion, but I think it's, it's an interesting trade-off. Um, so the other thing is that NPM scripts are written as plain text in JSON, which probably sounds to you like, ew, gross, that's disgusting, you know? We don't have variables, we can't do something like create a build system that can be extended to work on different repos. Um, and you know, it seems gross, but I think if, if the majority of your projects are 15 to 20 lines, you know, having that kind of code is a great trade-off for, you know, having to repeat pass a couple of times. You can also experiment with ways of, you know, building your package JSON, but I've never, you know, people have suggested that to me, but I've never really found the need to do so. Um, so another thing, I'm not gonna lie, especially if your project supports Windows, which if it's open source, hopefully it does, um, you're gonna have to take some time to learn what you can and can't do. You know, I, I think personally the benefits are well worth it, and they're gonna give you a lot of useful transferable skills when you're working in other environments. And you know, that NPM scripts are inherently testable because they're separate and you can call them in isolation. So if you can run them on some kind of CI, absolutely go for it. It will make your scripts a lot better. So finally, something a lot of JS build tools really do well um, is that this, you know, they have a great community around them. Um, because of the pluginless nature of NPM scripts, it's gonna be challenging to think of a model to share strategies and recipes and um, you know, ideas to push it forward. So you know, I think we're gonna have to think of a way to build a community around it, build ways of doing things well um, you know, that uh, can push it forward. So for example, you know, what if we built a shell implementation specific to NPM or Node that could be totally cross-compatible? The future could be super exciting, right? But we do need to start that dialogue. And that's pretty much it. So, Please, I'd love to see what you make, or NPM run, that is. Um, yeah, thanks a lot. <laughs>